Thank you so much and good evening. Let me at the outset take this opportunity to thank the directors and staff of both the Research Center for Human Rights of the University of Vienna and the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights for organizing this Nelson Mandela Centenary Lecture. But I'm going to correct myself, this is not a lecture, it's a conversation, it's dialogue. And so where I read lecture substituted with conversation on the creation and protection of constitutional democracy in South Africa, in cooperation with the South African Embassy and Permanent Mission in Austria. We are equally happy that Professor Manfred Novak, an esteemed academic, has agreed to moderate this session. And he's actually the host of this. So we thank you, Prof, and your team for receiving us and hosting Justice de Ram This year, 2018, marks the centenary of the late Nelson Mandela, anti-apartheid liberation struggle icon, a global hero in the fight for human rights and justice, and the first president of democratic and free South Africa. Nelson Mandela would have turned 100 years of age on 18 July this year. In this regard, we thought there could be no better person to invite to give a lecture or a conversation <coughs> to celebrate and reflect on the legacy of Nelson Mandela than Justice Dikang Musenek. It is therefore my pleasure to welcome you this evening, to welcome you to this evening to this human rights talk by one of South Africa's foremost proponents of human rights, a tireless advocate for justice and a high-caliber legal mind. I'm not saying this because he's no longer in the bench, so <laughs> in an event I appear before the court, the judge, <laughs> he will not be there, so I can say whatever I want to say <laughs> about him. Now, ladies and gentlemen and excellencies, Justice Moseneke has an illustrious legal career preceded by a heroic political life as a committed fighter for freedom. He dedicated his entire life to the fight for freedom, justice, and the creation of a better society in our own country. At the young age of 15, he was imprisoned for 10 years at Robben Island for challenging the unjust, inhumane, inhumane and criminal system of apartheid in South Africa. It is at Robben Island where he met fellow prisoner, Nelson Mandela and other stalwarts. While in prison, he furthered his studies, completing both grade 12 and university degrees, including one in law. Upon his release, he not only became a lawyer, but also the first black advocate to join an all-white Pretoria Bar in 1983, when he was, where he was later awarded the senior counsel status. Justice Mosineke is one of the technical drafters of the South African Constitution. He also served for 15 years as Deputy Chief Justice of the highest court in the country, the Constitutional Court. He retired in 2016. His contributions have been recognized through various awards. I'm not going to list them this, tonight. <laughs> However, last month, the president of our country, President Cyril Ramaphosa, bestowed on Justice Moseneke the Order of Lutuli, one of the highest national awards that South Africa can bestow on a citizen for his outstanding contribution to the field of law and the administration of justice in South Africa. This past Friday, one of the leading universities in South Africa, Rhodes University, awarded him an honorary Doctor of, law, uh, Doctor of Law's degree for his exceptional contribution to jurisprudence in South Africa. This added to a collection of honorary doctorates <coughs> he has previously received in South Africa and internationally. Ladies and gentlemen, and before I even conclude this, uh, and it's not me who wrote this, it's, it's, it's Dr. Pizzuani, the deputy head of mission who wrote <laughs> all these beautiful words about Dr. But however, we may add also this that Justice Musenek has also written an autobiography, which is called My Own Liberator. And so I had the opportunity whilst I was home to read it on my way coming this side. And I've been encouraging all my colleagues at the mission 
to read it. On this note, it is, my, now, it is now my singular honor and privilege to present to you Justice Dikang Moseneke and to deliver, uh, to invite him to join me here, to come to this uh, lectern and commence with his conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Seokole, Excellencies, uh, Justice uh, Mozeneke. Uh, I am extremely honored uh, to host you this evening here on behalf of the Ludwig Boltzmann Institute of Human Rights and the Research Center Human Rights of the University of Vienna. Uh, we are doing regularly these human rights talks on all kind of um, interesting human rights issues, but this is a, a special evening. Um, it's also for me a special evening because I, I, I consider myself as a, a long-term friend of South Africa. Um, and with that I mean um, I, I have been, not at the time when you were imprisoned, I was still too young, but uh, in the 19, late, since late, the late 1970s, I was an active member of the Austrian anti-apartheid movement. And we, we did all kinds of advocacy work, but also scientific work, writing articles about uh, the apartheid system and uh, trying whatever we could do, very little to, uh, to participate in, in those boycotts and ways of changing the system and uh, I've been quite often invited at that time and I always denied. I said I never will go accept an invitation to the apartheid regime of South Africa. But I was very happy to be for the first time in South Africa exactly at the time of the first elections. And that was for me an amazing experience, this kind of <coughs> young nation being born and this this feeling is, I have been several times afterwards in South Africa, and it's always again this feeling uh, that makes me uh, incredibly proud of the way how Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and all the heroes, including yourself, uh, of the, uh, the struggle were managing a peaceful transition with a Truth and Reconciliation Commission rather than criminal courts and uh, a peaceful transition into a post-apartheid uh, South African uh, system. Of course, not without problems. We all have problems, but uh, I think it's, it's, uh, South Africa is a very, very specific country. And it's one of the most beautiful constitutions. You were one of the drafters uh, of, of the constitutions. Uh, that, that I know, uh, in terms of human rights, you have the dignity in the Constitution. You have uh, so many uh, yeah, important elements, and then, of course, the Constitutional Court. I knew many, the first president and other presidents of the Constitutional Court, uh, and I was following from the very beginning judgments like the one on the death penalty or the one on same-sex marriages, and th th there are so, so many that are differently written than, if I may say, I, I don't think there are any judges of the Austrian Constitutional Court, but uh, not, uh, yeah, yeah, the, uh, so, but I may, I may, of course, yeah, I st still say it, which is a very, a very legal approach, and, uh, and, and it's a, a beautiful approach, and whatever, but this is a much more poetic approach, it's a much more philosophical approach, and if you, if you read these judgments, uh, they take from all the other jurisdictions uh, that really rely on so much knowledge and wisdom that there is in order to come to their own conclusions, which are often uh, really pioneering judgments. Pioneering judgments in the field of economic, social, and cultural rights, which you are not allowed to judge because they are not part of our constitution. We are old-fashioned in that field. You, you have economic, social, cultural rights in the constitution. Um, so um, 
I, I am really privileged to, um, to, to moderate this. Uh, the last time I was in South Africa, I just told you, was uh, last uh, December, around the 10 December, where the whole Human Rights Week, I should also say that the University of Pretoria is one of 100 universities in our global campus of human rights, so we do quite much together with our, our colleagues in, in Pretoria. Uh, and it's uh, the law faculty of Pretoria was just awarded when I was there as the best law faculty in Africa. Um, and it's definitely well deserved. Uh, they also are running the African master in, in human rights, which is uh, the best by far uh, master programs uh, in, in, in the African region and in the world, I, I would say. Um, and there are also uh, listen to a very beautiful speech of your colleague, uh, Justice Albi Sachs, uh, on the occasion of uh, unveiling a bust of Oliver Tambo that was dedicated to the law faculty of the University of Pretoria. Uh, so, and I could go on in, 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 in saying, but it's, it's, it's for me always special. I have been on Robben Island uh, on, on one occasion, and uh, was also very, very impressed about um, all that you can see there. It was not a normal tourist guide. We were invited by, um, by, by people when we had a, a conference in, in Cape Town. Um, so it was a special guiding tour to Robben Island, which was for me also a, a lasting experience in, 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 my, in my memory, imagining uh, what life would have looked at that time. So, uh, having said that, I, I simply hand over the microphone to you. Uh, I really, if you would like to speak from there or there, it's really up to you. Um, and uh, uh, on the one hand, we would a little bit like to know more about your life, uh, but of course, uh, primarily also uh, about your achievements as a uh, as a judge, you were not only a, a justice a member of the Constitutional Court, you were deputy and acting chief justice um, of, of the court. Uh, so you have, and you were quite a long time, uh, between 2004 or 2005 until 2016 when you retired. So you have quite a, a long experience in the court. But also to be the first black South African on the bar in Pretoria is a big achievement. At that time, it was unthinkable still uh, that this was possible. So uh, again, today, it's, but at, at that time, it, it's, yeah, it was a different mindset. Um, so um, I think you are uh, in yourself very much representing uh, this struggle from the very beginning to a very successful end, or not end, but as highlight in, 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 in your career. So please um, tell us a little bit about your experiences and then we will perhaps have a short discussion among ourselves, but I will very quickly then hand over to the, uh, to the audience. I'm sure there are many persons who would be very eager to discuss with you questions of uh, constitutionality, of human rights, or any other issues I know you're not a politician, you're a judge, but still also about the present political system uh, or constitutional system. There are major changes ongoing presently in South Africa. So you have the floor. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Thank you <coughs> Professor. <coughs> you know, sir, as a judge, I always sit. And I thought I would stand. And one of the reasons is simply that I, I prepared speaking notes. <coughs> so it'll be easier to flip them over when I'm on my feet than when I'm seated. And we've agreed that I'm going to be on my feet for 20 minutes. And, um, and you said to me, forget about the law. Talk about yourself, you said to me. <laughs> because you've got such an interesting past. But actually, um, I have a few things to say about our country, its transition, 
and, and where we are currently. And this, I will say, within the context of um, fundamental human rights. But I'd like to say a few things about my presence here. And I think it is indeed a privilege to be a guest at the Ludwig Boltzmann Research Institute of Human Rights. And um, I must say it is quite well known, an independent and leading human rights research institute since 1992, I've gathered. And also gathered that you're located within the University of Vienna. Um, and I'll just bowl over by its remarkable history. 1365, um, and therefore, Professor Manfred Novak, it is, it's a privilege to be here. But I must also thank my ambassador. I've learned when I was a young man, if you travel, you start by thanking the ambassador from your country. Uh, he's not only the most senior country representative, but he's my principal host. I get it, and if the ambassador decides to turn against me, then I'll be thrown out of here very quickly. <laughs> but thank you for having me here, and thank you for the invitation. Um, for this evening, very briefly, I've chosen to reminisce about the transition of our beloved country from colonialism and apartheid to a constitutional democracy. It's still a great story, the human experience, I think. And I'd like to talk very briefly about what we did after. After setting up the Constitution, what did we do? And I'll move on to talk about the democratic project and its current challenges, our challenges. And I'm sure you'll have many questions about that. And I'll end up with a, with a short prognosis. Where are we? What is the state of the patient? Is the patient dying? <clears throat> Excuse me, or will the patient survive all this? Um, and, and I must say that I'm talking to you certainly as a jurist. I was a freedom fighter in my youth. And my bounden desire was to destroy apartheid. So as a young child soldier, I was a revolutionary and very committed to destroy a system which on all accounts was very, very evil. But what I really want to talk about is that transition, the outcome, and to remind you that that remains a very wonderful story, as I say. We, we are essentially a post-conflict society, aren't we, South Africa? And our history of colonial dispossession and racial conflict spent over 342 years. Think about it. Nearly three and a half centuries, starting with the Dutch occupation of the Cape in 1652. <clears throat> the English came, overcame the Dutch, and established their rule for two and a half centuries. And that's why we speak English. Um, and they stayed there for quite a long time. The discovery of diamonds and gold didn't help either. They entrenched them, there was a gold rush, everybody came from Europe, came to our country, and that helped entrench our oppression. It was essentially, it meant, essentially it meant that more and more people would come out there to go and find the, the gold and the diamond that wasn't our situation. And this runs us through the formation of the union in, in, in 1910. And when that happened, that in fact was a consolidation of the colonial conquest, in the sense that most Europeans who came out there decided to live forever, but to rule the place, surprise, surprise, to the exclusion of everybody else, except white males. They disenfranchised even white females. And as they did that, they made a law that proclaimed 87% of the land to be of exclusive white ownership or occupation. <coughs> of course, the gold rush stimulated industrial development. 
and that made South Africa to be a slightly better place. But the implications were also horrific. It meant that more and more indigenous people had to go and work at the mines. And cheap labor was necessary if you had to increase your profits. And there the roots of apartheid came in. So laws were made that were intended to exclude others in order to maximize profits. So you ended up with landless, unskilled migrant workers who lived in urban squalor, homelessness. And at the time, of course, Professor, there was no catalog of constitutional human rights. Parliament was supreme. It was entitled to override rights, and that may be located in the common law or in any other statutes. So Parliament was supreme, and Parliament often ruled that women will end two-thirds of what men end, and that was law, incapable of challenge or constitutional review. So apartheid was built on the edifice of the law, and that's really where, where I'm getting to. And sovereignty of parliament was meant to immunize any challenge to truly bad laws um, that excluded just about everybody except white masculinity. And that's really what apartheid translated itself to. Because patriarchy was alive and well, and, and, and women, by and large, suffered under it. And if you're black women, of course, there's double jeopardy of race and, and, and gender. Um, and by and large, at the time, judges did what the law required them to do, to implement racial exclusion and oppression and gender intolerance. And what was important, Professor, was the total negation of international standard and norms. They were developing around the world, but as apartheid moved on, it was totally impervious to what happened, for instance, <clears throat> with all of the conventions that came after the Second World War that began to develop common notions of human decency across the world. <coughs> thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not imprison without due process, thou shalt not keep others out on the grounds of their faith, their religion, their gender, their sexual orientation, let's go on. So apartheid is normally seen as a mere race between, but in essence it was a negation and rejection of human rights, norms and standards that were evol evolving within the global community over a long time. And therefore domestic and international resistance to this horrific oppression was inevitable. You didn't have to be a genius to understand that there would be, and indeed in 1912, the African National Congress came to be the first liberation movement on the African continent, and six years later, Nelson <coughs> Holisatha Mandela was born. We often think that he was almost born when the ANC was formed. It was only six years when the African National Congress was formed in 1912. And I pause to remark that this is, of course, the centenary year of his birth. Hundred years had he lived. A milestone we, together with the rest of the world, are rightly celebrating. He was a great human being. And the avowed object of the African National Congress at the time, no doubt, was to dismantle colonialism and apartheid and bring a just society to our shores. And together with that, of course, there were other veritable liberation movements the Pan-Africanist Congress, the Berkhamshire's Movement, the United Democratic Front on the Home Front, all of these made very sterling contributions, including a number of white compatriots who espoused progressive values of non-racialism in an egalitarian setting. And I must immediately add and recognize the considerable, with considerable gratitude the part played by global solidarity, Professor, you're referring to that now, and support. I can't imagine of a cause which attracted more global rejection than apartheid. And, and that rejection increased, and to a point and culminating with, of course, the United Nations declaring apartheid to be a crime against humanity. If we pause for a moment, indeed it was. 
It was a total negation of the humanity of others. It was a bankrupt notion of our humanity. It suggested that mere superficial external differences are a marker of our capabilities. Bunkum, bankrupt, nonsense. They're more enduring and more important markers of our humanity than how we look about our gender, about our sexual orientation, about the way we pray, the way we eat, the way we laugh, the way we recreate. Those are the least important external. We brought to a halt apartheid. We negotiated. We wrote a new constitution. In two or three papers which are published, I write about the negotiation process and the constitution writing process. And I'm not talking about that today. Let me rather go down the route of patriotic vanity. In the wake of the Arab Spring, a U.S. Supreme Court Justice, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, whilst visiting Egypt, was asked to provide advice on constitution making. She's reported to have said, and I quote her, I would not look to the United States Constitution if I was drafting a constitution in 2017. Close quote. She recommended to the Egyptians to look, in her words, open quote, South African Constitution and perhaps the Canadian chapter of rights and, and freedoms and the European Convention on Human Rights. So allow me a bit of that boast, right? A fascinating law journal, it's entitled The Declining Influence of the United States Constitution, penned by two American law professors, and bemoans the decline of American constitutionalism around the world. Then the article reports on an empirical study of constitutions of the world and finds that four constitution are influential benchmarks to modern constitution making. And it lists Canada, Germany, and us. So it's a way of taking a bow from that horrible history I've just told you now, battling oppression, exclusion, and stupid hatred for 346 years. We overcome that, bring it to a screeching halt, negotiate a principal transition, and we sit down on a blank sheet to write our notion of a just society. And we write it out in a constitution, in simple language, readable by everybody, and we set out our notions of a just society. And therefore, our constitutional democracy, I like saying, was forged on the anvil of division. We knew that we'd come from a divided society, from past injustice, from economic inequality. But also it, it was based on the hope of reconciliation. And that's where Nelson Mandela and the leaders around him are important, nation building and social cohesion. So we wanted a higher moral authority than our oppressors. And we young lions, I remember asking that Mandela, I was always his second-hand man, I always one of his key confidantes, though I did not come from his political party. He always talked to me. He invited me to come and write the constitution. And I said, why are we doing this? Why are we forgiving them? They oppressed us, they jailed us, they jailed you for 27 years. They maimed us, they made us disappear. They denied our humanity and dignity. Why are we doing this? And he says to me, um, listen to me carefully. Danam, my son, he's my father's age. We are buying peace in order to create space for our own development. So we're making certain sacrifices in order to create space and peace for us to live. We could choose, of course, to hate forever. That is one option, which is available to everybody. And the other option is not to forget, but to make up your mind that you're going to move on and reconstruct 
the devastation of 340 years. So his reasoning was actually quite sharp and to the point. He wasn't saying it, what happened in the past didn't matter. Far from it. And that's why I've recounted it to you just now to remind you. It's a horrible history. He was saying we have to create space to find our own humanity and to reconstruct our world. That's, that's the answer that, that he gave me. Now, we made a number of choices when we wrote the Constitution. One of this was that it will be the will of the people. It will be a democracy, which our party was not. And we made sure that it will be both representative and participatory. In its architecture, you'll find so, that people speak more than just at the elections and a variety of stages where we make law. And we decided to have a supreme constitution, not a sovereign one, because apartheid is a sovereign constitution, and parliament, and, and it was a horrible thing, because parliament could kill others with a conscience. And therefore, we'd have a rule of law, we'd have fundamental rights and freedoms, and would induct this in the founding provisions of our Constitution. And we entrench this with three quarters. So you cannot alter chapter one of our Constitution because it's double entrenched and you need a super majority in order to change the character, the republic character of our Constitution. is democratic essence, a supreme Constitution, the rule of law, and judicial review. So that is the character, that is what we wanted. Nobody should be able to wake up and say, all women shall earn two thirds of what men earn. There should be a court with the power to strike that law down as inconsistent with our notion of a just society. And our constitution then goes ahead to set out the founding values of the constitution. Few constitutions do that. These are the basic founding values of our constitution, and first of which should be human dignity. So it's a justiciable value. There have been lots of papers about it being open-ended and vague. We have not found it vague, as our jurisprudence shows. We committed to strive for equality, something absent in apartheid. It's a very significant part of, of our pact. And as I said, that we would all the time have a rule of law and would refuse to act outside the parameters of what is common decency. But we go ahead and, and recognize the devastation of apartheid and therefore providing the constitution itself, economic, social, and cultural rights, and we make them justiciable. We enjoined the state to provide them. And the only way they could escape from their obligation, if they were, the state were to successfully raise the defense that the right is subject to progressive realization and subject to available resources. Unable to make out that case, and if they were to make out the case, then they will have to set up a plan that shows that there is a plan for progressive realization and failing which they might have to rely on available resources. They'll have to disclose their budgetary burdens to show that in fact they don't have the money and often they're not able to do so. Education is a right too, but it is no, it's not subject to progressive realization. So it's instantly available. That is primary education or basic education. And we go on, of course, to enjoin the executive and the whole state to act in a responsive, open, accountable way. It must put up governance in which all the organs of state would be accountable. Parliament must make laws and hold executives accountable and would debate matters of national interest. The executive must implement the laws 
and spend the fiscal allocations properly, and courts must resolve disputes within the Constitution and the law, which includes African indigenous law and our common law inherited from the Roman Dutch law. It must follow from what I've just said that our constitutional design was meant to be emphatically transformative. It was not a constitution where we recorded pre-existing separation and parceling out of power. It was a constitution which had a clear mission to migrate us from the horrible past to a more hope hopeful future. So it was designed to be a tool to change society, if you like, it was meant to be a revolutionary constitution. And what have we done since then? We've done some good things and some bad things. First, the good things. We certainly went ahead to dismantle racial domination. Power, political power shifted without a doubt. One person, one vote. And we made sure that there was no racial dominance in society uh, like save in the way that I will describe in a moment. So we've managed, firstly, a treacherous transition. We set up ground rules that underscore our democratic ethos and public morality and governance. We have established and maintained a functional democratic state. We go to elections every five years with all the customary markers, including multipartism, regular elections, rule of law, separation of powers. So on the face of it, all those things work. We are a functioning and a pretty good democracy for that matter. Our parliamentary system functions. Um, our fiscal and state treasury functions, and are not shabby, our revenue collection is world class. Our courts are indeed independent and effective and probably world class. And we have a number of institutions that we established ever since 1994 with the disappearance of apartheid. Auditor General's Office, the Electoral Commission, the Human Rights Commission, the Public Protector's Office, to name but a few. And those work pretty well. And we boast of a very robust civil society that takes on social causes in our country. Nothing could happen and not draw the attention of many busy bodies who are concerned about social justice. Think about the campaigns around HIV and AIDS and access to medication, access to health care, campaigns around genderized violence, access to textbooks, to education. And therefore, a history of struggle and protestation, we can see it come through currently. We have arguably one of the best, or the freest press, I'm not saying best, the freest press in the world. It writes what it likes, is very investigative, and indeed, it is quite watchful. And let me also add to that, we have ample street protests in South Africa. People have learned from the past, and if something is wrong, you'll know about it. You'll see them in the streets with placards and things telling their rulers that they're unhappy. And it's not a bad thing. It's not quite like Vienna. It looks calm and quiet <laughs> and orderly. And everything seems to, to work properly. Where I come from, people do tell you when they're unhappy, and they do so loudly with placards in the streets, and you will know whether you are on their, they're on your side or not. But another thing of real joy, uh, Ambassador, you may not have thought about this. There's not even one political prisoner in South Africa. Ever since we took power, nobody has been jailed for their beliefs, religious or otherwise. Just about nobody. We as a court declared marriages to be permissible between people of the same sex. We were summoned by bishops and cardinals and church people. You judges have gone mad. Um, but nobody has been arrested. Nor did I dare to arrest them for calling me mad. So it is that kind of society. So there are obvious gains and there is simply just no political prisoner. You won't find a journalist in our country arrested only for what they write, or political people arrested for their beliefs. Apart the time the jails were full, I was a victim, Mr. Mandela was a victim, and many, many others were victims. 
So our transition has yielded much. And I can give a good example as a judge. Um, we had ample discrimination cases. And we gave judgments that struck down, that gave proper orders in each of those. And in, the, in a series of notable cases, we have refused to tolerate inequality and discrimination. They are there in our jurisprudence. We have struck down scores of laws that undermined appropriate respect for diversity, or how about antiquated prejudices? I miss many rumblings, courts have not tolerated, uh, for example, to act against homophobia or gender inequality inspired by religious or cultural uh, patriarchy. We have delivered a number of judgments around substantive equality that travels well beyond the liberal notion of mere formal equality before the law. We have insisted that laws and policy must provide adequate protection for children, root out domestic violence, people with disability, refugees, as well as migrants. Quite early in our life, of course, we struck down capital punishment as inconsistent with fundamental notions of human decency and rights. We have required our executives to do a number of things in court orders for those of you who have been following up around socioeconomic claims of the poor and vulnerable. We have required them to provide access to health care. HIV and AIDS is an example. Happily so today, we probably are one of the best jurisdictions for public treatment of HIV and AIDS. We have reminded the executive of that due to provide access to housing. We have mediated differences of rampant evictions between farmers and homeless and farm workers. And I have a whole catalog of things that the courts have done and orders that we have issued. Quite proud. And as we did that, we drew from the jurisprudence of the whole world. The European Court of Human Rights, you look at our judgments, you know, Professor, they run like an encyclopedia of what other jurisdictions and other courts have said on these issues. Because out of the global solidarity, we draw from those values of human decency that you find in other jurisdictions. And May so rest in peace before Justice Scalia died. I had an occasion to visit the Supreme Court in the US. And I was making the point to him that I thought he was hopelessly wrong. Because he thinks it's treasonable to cite any other jurisdiction which is non-American. Because essentially you seek to impose a non-American ethos on a constitution that is truly and thoroughly domestic. And I said, no, but human norms and values and decency extends way beyond any domestic jurisdiction. And that, in my respectful view, you are wrong. As you are wrong with originalism. That constitutions are incapable of any interpretation except what was on the minds of the finding fathers and mothers. And I hope when I am long dead, nobody will suggest that because I wrote, one of those who wrote the constitution, the only view is my interpretation of it. I would hope it will be a living document that continues to, to live on its own. <clears throat> and it is also true that our constitutional project is totally inimical to corruption, to misgovernance, to misrule, and the abuse of, 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 of funds. <coughs> and our courts have spent a lot of time in battling public and private corruption in South Africa. Um, in my closing remark, I make the point that the debate is now over. There's a time when it appeared that only the courts sense the horrible smell of corruption around it. And to those of you who have time, I commend you to a case called Glenister, which was delivered by the Constitutional Court, in which in those early days we warned that you need a proper crime-busting institution, and that the Constitution properly read <coughs> and joins and requires <coughs> us to have proper mechanisms to arrest corruption. Because corruption is inconsistent with fundamental rights and freedoms. They cannot be accomplished 
and achieved when there are severe leakages from the public funds, which are intended to meet most of the socioeconomic rights, which are subject to availability of resources. So if the resources dissipate, it follows that the rights will not be met. And our judgments kept on happening in the last 10 years on this important point. Equally so, our competition law has found a niche in our courts, and this is admirable. In the past, our economy allowed very little real competition in the market because of structural and behavioral anti-competitiveness and concentration of ownership and control. So some of our manufacturing and retail businesses have been found by our courts to have been engaged in collusive practices, in price fixing, and in dodgy cartels. And this is sad, it's very unfortunate. So the Competition Commission and its tribunals have done very much an enviable work to remedy the, and to reduce commercial injustice and protecting consumers. But what are the challenges? <clears throat> As I close to your end, I'm going to sit down now. There are at least four very vital challenges. <clears throat> I'm not going to spend too much time on them because you're going to ask me those questions. I can see it all on your faces written already. <coughs> you read many newspapers and you, are, you serve the internet a lot. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> <clears throat> Sorry, <clears throat> you remember when I started, I told you about the pervasive landlessness and land dispossession that apartheid and colonialism caused. Sadly so, the situation has not changed much. I think it was Franz Fanon nearly 17 years, 70 years ago who reminded us just about how concrete land is. And, and, and for that reason, <clears throat> is viewed by many politically developing people to be where the bread comes from, but also about where all dignity comes from. And if you think for a moment that African National Congress itself was established in 1912, just immediately before the 1913 Land Act, this really was spared on. The revolt was the land question. Um, and when we wrote the Constitution, it was foremost in our minds. How do you deal with the land question? <coughs> and I can ask, answer questions about that, but there's a very careful formulation of the property clause. <coughs> a lot of it came, of course, out of a compromise. But at the same time, there's very many useful provisions I don't want to do the lawyering thing on you. We can deal with the details if you're interested in them. But the Constitution, the scheme of the property clause, starts with land restitution. It envisages those who have been dispossessed in the past to file claims to the land claims court and to claim their land back. That runs back to 1913. Of course, this means that you have to find the material and the historical proof that in fact it was your land and it was dispossessed in certain circumstances. And I can tell you in a moment the difficulties and the hurdles that many unschooled and tutored people encountered in doing so. And very little progress has been done on that front. Over 25,000, 30,000 cases are hovering around in <coughs> administrative bunkers up and very little has been done to make sure that that part of the scheme, the other part of the scheme is the power of the state to expropriate land by a law of general application for a public purpose. So you could wake up one morning and say, I like that piece of land and take it. There's be a law of general application it must evince a public purpose, and it must be subject to compensation. That is essentially the scheme of law. The scheme is being challenged currently, and a lot of debate about whether the scheme is correct. But that is the pact that was, <coughs> excuse me, that was cut at a particular time. And when there's no agreement between the owner of the land 
and the government that is expropriating courts. The Constitution requires courts to determine what is just and equitable compensation. Not whether or not there should be compensation, but what is just and equitable compensation. And after 25 years, it must be said, now I'll, I'll wrap up this, and there's a script for lawyers who may want to read all the legalities about it. Very little has been done, almost nothing has been done. Land restitution, even the clauses that are on the Constitution have not been sweated, have not been used significantly. And I express the view here that in fact, the state of the law, a lot of the land could be made available, starting with state land, and move on to un <clears throat> unused land, unoccupied land, so you can move in degrees as you meet and try to deal with land hunger uh, in the country. Um, um, and regrettably, very little has been done on this front, and that must be admitted, was one of the things that we never implemented properly since 19, for the last 25 years. Whether we ought to do more and change the law in particular ways, the debate that must be had. But laws mean nothing if they can't be implemented and they need to be implemented. The second challenge that continues to be there with the democratic project is inequality. And social justice, despite the grandeur of the Constitution, there are problems. And those problems are really described by the World Bank, which has just completed a study more lately, which, and I quote, even with progressive tax system, inequality in South Africa was still higher than other 11 countries in the same sample. And the countries in the sample were Armenia, Bolivia, Brazil, Costa Rica, El Salvador, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Indonesia, Mexico, Peru, and Uruguay. So they were, they were themselves countries with mid-development um, together with us, and we came out last amongst them <clears throat> on, on the inequality score that they developed. Even though South Africa has a very effective use of its fiscal tools, the World Bank reports the original problem in e income inequality problems in income inequality are so high that South Africa is going to need other things to help address its problems of inequality. To make further progress going forward, you need to complement fiscal policy with higher and more inclusive growth that essentially generates jobs, especially at the lower end of distribution. It all boils down to economic growth. A lot has happened since 1994. About 3.6 million people have been lifted above the poverty line. We've used social grants in order to stem hunger at the door. <clears throat> but the GNI coefficient on income still remains quite horrible. And I go on to look at a couple of statistics. The third problem is misgovernance and corruption. There was a time, certainly during the last 10 years, when some in the governing party denied that misrule and corruptions were fundamental threats to the democratic project. That denial happily and mercifully has disappeared. In fact, the recalling of our president, past president, by his own party, is about corruption and misrule. And President Ramaphosa's election, again, is about the hope to correct corruption and misrule. And his declaration the very day he was elected was war against unlawful conduct, against patronage, against pervasive corruption that we now know on all reports that it runs into billions, even of euros. And of course, the dominant effect of pillaging patronage and predatory behavior has been low service delivery to the poor and the marginalized, low economic growth and ample civil society campaigns and grassroots impatience. And the media on this very weekend, for instance, this very Sunday, points to massive financial bleeding of Transnet. That runs into over 50 billion rand. 
Uh, indeed, the work of our courts resisted this, as I say, in the last 10 years. So did the public protector and, and other invest, investigative journalism. So it is no longer, it, it may not, no longer be necessary because our, our new president has vowed to put a stop to this shameless weakening of public institutions, patronage, and treasonable neglect of public goods, particularly of vulnerable citizens. In the scenario of, of the last 10 years I've just told you now, I've just sketched, I did not say anything more about the source of crime and violent protest. Many of them lie in history, but others lie in misgovernance and, and corruption. My last paragraph, Professor, I promise, and I've written it out, I'm going to read it, because I felt strongly enough about it to sit down and write it down. Now, ours is a great country. You've heard the heroism of our people and their struggles over 340 years. And after centuries of conflict, we avoided an out and out race war. We're big hearted enough to know that we are better in peace than at war. We inducted democratic practice and constitutionalism underpinned by a chapter of fundamental rights and freedoms, in which we have protected by and large pretty well. If you're in doubt, we live in peace and often celebrate both our unity and our diversity. We have the blessings of a remarkably beautiful country with a modern world-class infrastructure. And if you don't know it, a modern economy the problem is half of us are poor and live on the margins of a good society we fought for. We must again find our way and bring everybody into the fold of inclusive prosperity. And I want to suggest to you that the last 10 years were a blip in a long journey or a wheel puncture on a long trip. You change the wheels and you get on with the trip. And that's what we must do and are going to do as South Africans. Our new president understands the ominous challenges I had, but also the huge potential for us to be one of the greatest nations of the world. Thank you for listening. Justice Mosenecke, thanks very much <laughs> for this wonderful speech. And if I may just take up two points that you mentioned. And uh, at the end, you, you emphasized on one of the four challenges, the inequality. No? Um, and um, if you look at statistics, um, South Africa, figures at the most unequal country in the world. On the Gini uh, coefficient, it's about 60. Um, and um, others, like the United States, are still below 50. And, and, um, and so... And Austria? <laughs> Austria is, in that respect, still fairly, fairly equal. Also, we are, we are uh, even within the European Union, we are above the average, um, but not like uh, the Nordic countries. So. But um, uh, the, the question that I posed, I, I, I wrote recently, and my editor is sitting here, uh, a book on, uh, on economic inequality and uh, human rights and answer to economic inequality. And there I'm arguing, and that's the question that I would like to put to you, that at a certain point, um, the level of economic inequality, and I mean primarily income inequality, also 
of course, uh, uh, inequality of wealth, but primarily income inequality, is undermining the social fabric and undermining also the, the democratic consistency, the, the, the kind of social contract. Um, and there is a right, a beautiful right also in the South African constitution of equality, but not only equality before the law, but the equal protection of the law. Um, and what I would like to argue is that at a certain point when it's so unequal, it might also be justiciable that you say uh, the government is not doing enough to provide equality by the law. So there's a positive obligation uh, by whatever means, uh, tax laws or inheritance laws or whatever, property laws, uh, etc., to uh, reduce economic inequality. Would that be uh, something that you could imagine that the Constitutional Court uh, would take up as an, as an issue? Uh, just a legal, of course it's a political problem, but as a legal problem. Well, the temptation to say yes is big, as you'd imagine. Um, yes, it's income inequality, and it's got a, a historical trajectory. In the past, you always maximized your profits by paying the workers the least. But I believe the workers didn't look exactly like you. You would do it sooner and quicker, and also paying women less, uh, and paying foreigners, migrants less. So people just maximize that way, and that in fact entrenches and deepens inequality. <coughs> that debate is deep, just like the land question, that debate is deep in South Africa. Um, what activist groups have done, they've normally chosen specific things to litigate around. Housing, they've succeeded. Access to health care. Um, access, for instance, to um, ablution blocks or sanitation, and those are easier claims because they, they have their location in the Constitution, in the text. And when they come to us, it's much easier to deal with them because the government has then has to raise the defenses, which I've said. You know, they must say we don't have the money, or they must say we're actually dealing with a point, you know, subject to progressive realization. When it comes to inequality, as you've heard from the piece I read from the World Bank, our government has done a lot taxation-wise. Our fiscal regime is quite tight. I mean, um, marginal tax in South Africa in the hands of people who live there sits at 45%. Plus a GST, a general sales tax, or that of 15%. So it's quite a hefty taxation system. Um, so yes, a claim like that would be, I imagine negative somebody coming to court and say, the tax is too high. I think the court will say, but the government has an obligation to equalize society, to provide education, to provide. Um, no such claim has come. If it were to come to be complicated jurisprudentially, but it's not inconceivable at all. Um, what has taken away forget legal, the moral justification for a step like this has been the extent of the leakage uh, on, the, on, 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 the, on, on the revenue side. Other companies who don't pay their full taxes because they think the money is being wasted or, or being stolen. And on the other hand, money that actually does, is not used for the purposes. So the debate has become a little difficult at this stage. You know, is, is there enough money or not? And some people are saying, well, if it doesn't disappear, there, there might be enough money. Um, I don't think so. I think that is one of the problem but the key issue must surely be to heighten skills which are relevant to the economy. Thank you. And the, the second question, and then I, I hand over to the 
uh, to the audience, um, you also mentioned same-sex marriage. And again, for many people in the world, it's kind of amazing that in such a homophobic continent as Africa is, where still people are talking about the death penalty for gays and lesbians, uh, South Africa is introducing same-sex marriage. Um, so how is that possible? And of course, it's based also on a, on a judgment uh, by, the, by the Constitutional Court. And there I draw now a certain comparison to Austria, because we also had recently um, a, a judgment that is opening up of the Constitutional Court, um, opening up the possibility of same-sex marriage in, in, in Austria. Um, and the Austrian court uh, based it simply on the right to equality and non-discrimination and avoided what the European court was always doing, looking at into Article 12 of the European Convention that's saying only men and women have the right to marry. So I think it was a very, and I would also be happy to hear your opinion. In my opinion, it was a, a very clever move of the Austrian Constitutional Court to forget about the European Convention and just apply the Austrian, the Austrian non-discrimination clause. Uh, if I look at the... Well done, by the way. Though you came like 15 years after us. I know, I know. It was... Uh, but it's not that often that in countries same-sex marriage was actually introduced by means of a, a judicial decision. It was in the United States, of course, with Obergefell, and, uh, and, and there, the, the question that I would like to raise is, um, you are arguing differently, and you are arguing to some extent with the right to dignity, also, uh, of course, non-discrimination, and then making a comparison with the earlier time when, because of racism, different ethnic groups are different, I don't want to use the word racist, it's, uh, uh, but were not allowed to marry. And there were, of course, judgments about that. And then saying, if, you, if we apply this principle and still think that this has been a, a law of apartheid, then it is also a law of apartheid, a type of other apartheid, if people, uh, if gays and lesbians are denied the right to marry, to same-sex marriage. Um, and um, was that, in your opinion, also the main kind of, of argument? So if there wouldn't have been an apartheid system before, you wouldn't have same-sex marriage. Is that something well, one, one could argue? <coughs> Well, yeah, because of apartheid, in 1994, when we read our constitution, we said, what are the hateful things? And we had a laundry list. Age, you know, pregnancy, marital status, uh, the whole range of things, horrible things, lines that we draw about each other and move on to enforce them in ways that are terrible. And apartheid was... As I said earlier, it was far more than just race. Yeah. It was patriarchal. It excluded women. It hated people who did not think that, for instance, it was a Christian state. The conscience said so. It's a national Christian state. So if you are not Christian in South Africa, you are on the margins, on the periphery. If you are not male, you are in trouble. If you are, so <clears throat> and then they used to have torches at night and look at bedrooms to see, you know, what is the color of what they see through the window, you know? Um, and they're trying to stop black and white couples from being together. Now, those things are deeply hateful, and we knew it. And who wants, to, who wants to look into whose bedroom to see with whom, with male or female, are you sleeping with, you know? Who, nobody should care about that. So four or five, I mean, rights coming down, you're quite right, officer. Dignity being up front, because they're so invasive of dignity when we were there during apartheid days. Two young couples are in love and the government is interested in what they do or don't do. It's silly. Um, the law could not stop them being in love, but it could stop them from actually being intimate. And therefore to do that, they had to go and follow them up and follow them in their apartments. So for us, it was no brainer. But more importantly, the wedge argument besides privacy, besides dignity, besides 
non-discrimination. The risk is ever present. If you don't want to punish people for being gay, what else? What are the other exclusions? And, and how far do you go down the line? Because we know of how hideous, bizarre, and pervasive discrimination can become from our history. Um, the church has argued on the other side and represented that <clears throat> the Bible requires marriage, holy marriage, to be between one man and one woman to the exclusion of all others. And again, the definition is fine. But the real question was whether it's a matter that the state ought to concern itself with about who marries who and how, you know? Of course, the church must concern itself with it. And its adherents must be one man, one woman, to the exclusion of all others. That's fine. And our past president would have said, what? One man, five women, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so it wouldn't, have, it wouldn't have worked even for him, you know? So for us, it was, no, it was not difficult at all to understand that if you draw lines amongst and between people, you very quickly charge them. And as you do that, you find, and you use state mechanism. It doesn't matter if you have private prejudice, who cares? But if you use the state to enforce your prejudice, pray like me, you know, drink like me, eat like me, dress like me, look like me, that, then we down fundamentalism and real risk for any society. Thank you very much. So I am happy to get any kind of questions, comments, criticism, any kind of statements you would like to, to make, and perhaps we take a few together, and then I ask you to respond, please. Yes. Oh, uh, I expected you to be the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you very much for a very inspiring and uh, thought-provoking talk. I really appreciate that you took the time. Um, you mentioned on several occasions that uh, without implementation, laws mean nothing. And um, I'm also a, a great believer in the, uh, the beauty of the South African Constitution and s several of its other legal documents. And it feels to me, in, in many cases, that the main problem is implementation. And what do you think can be done in order to rectify that? Thank you. Is it fine if you take more, or would yes, you like sir, to immediately? It's fine. Yeah? By the way, Rene is one of our master students. May I ask for further comments or questions? A very different yes. style of question, but we didn't talk too much about your, your life and the earlier days, and I'm wondering what made you specifically so politically active at such a young age? We struggle sometimes with mobilizing the youth, so I'm wondering what was your inspiration? And if I may add on this, uh, because I think it was very at, at the time of the Sharpeville uh, incident or massacre, uh, have you been involved somehow in, in that uh, as well? I would be, be interested. Any other question before we... Perhaps, yeah, you would like to, to respond and yes. then we do a second uh, one. I'll, let me start the second question, which is easy, huh? No, I was a child, I was in primary school when Shabdil happened. Uh, I was much, much younger and I wasn't part of it at all. Um, but in my book, I spent time to talk about the impact of the Shabdil shooting on me and my worldview. Um, you know, now that I'm a grandfather, I've come to know that young people have a deep, almost an innate, inbuilt sense of right and wrong. Let me tell you how I test it quite often. I have a daughter and a son, and each has three children, so I have six grandchildren. 
When I get home, I become a real grandfather of six grandchildren. I take the first one, oh, sorry, the first one I give six sweeties, the second one I give three, and this one I give seven, and this one I give one, and the one, other one I almost skip, but I give two, and then they all have different, same sweeties in their hands. Grandpa, how dare you? You give him six, and you give me one. Grandpa, what's wrong with you? And then, the, and then there's a little riot in front of me. <laughs> and I look at it with great glee, which means my grandchildren are going to be good freedom fighters. <laughs> They're not going to take unfairness. But I think of your own children, don't they? they? They talk back. They tell you, right? This is not fair, Dad. What about this? But the young ones, they, they usually are at it. So I developed a near innate sense of unfairness when I grew up. And I write about it in my book. Uh, I don't know where I got it from, but I hated differentiation, which was irrational. And I could see the schools on the other side had lawns and playgrounds, and the school on my side had dust and dirt and grime. I could see the other side of town and the town where I lived. I could, I could see the differences. And my little brain wondered why. It didn't take me long to discover it's racism, it's racial oppression, and class oppression. Those two were wrapped up all into together. And a few other oppressions, religious oppression, exclusions, and so on. So I would hope young people would bring up young people with greater levels of awareness, rejecting to be treated unfairly, to be treated differently. And it's amount of social in our country is not difficult because we have this history. You saw young people rise with the so-called fees must fall movement. And they say you must pay for our fees. Why not? You know, if you can pay for black shiny cars, then you can pay for our fees. And so on and so on. So it's a healthy sense of awareness and consciousness. And society, I think, feeds on that. Other societies in Austria, complaints would be far less than, <coughs> in some would be far less than others. I understand that. But it's very important to keep that going. And that's why institutes for human rights are necessary to remind us of those norms and not to take them for granted. I think many societies slip away from that. Guantanamo, I mean, horrible thing happened in America. But they have to <coughs> expect the rule of law to kick in in a way that respects some of the fundamental principles. You don't keep people in detention for five years. You don't charge them. You don't bring them before a court. So contentious as it is, there are norms and standards which of human decency, and they're, they're important. And young people should be... I started for the reasons I told you, and I hated apartheid from there. And I joined the political movement in no time. I was in jail in no time. Met political prisoners of great integrity and level. There are many, Mr. Mandela, Gatti Mutuping, Gatti Susulu, Harry Gwala. I can go on. Most of all those great freedom fighters from our country, Jeff Tamasemola, and so on. And, and it was, the vision was clear. It was a better society, which was free from all the limitations that we have. And we must try and convey that to young people all the time. Because it's not too difficult to have an oppressive regime, an insensitive regime, uh, and responses to some of the things in the world show it. It's not too difficult. Implementation, yes, yes, yes. I was giving a taste of the things we did right. So we have implemented a good part of our constitution. We talk, for instance, about a foreign mission, our foreign relations. We have a fully fleshed, proper operating foreign missions around the world. And so on. So there are things that we got right, that we implemented, that we worked around. So I don't want to give the impression that everything, but there are things that we did not do well. And I've cited to the four big ones, for instance. Um, 
One such example is the institutions we built. The Constitutional Court is one such example. And the whole judiciary is almost world class, really, truly so. I'm just going to see whether we write, what we do, and how we've kept the executive at bay to behave properly. Um, and there are many other institutions like that in South Africa which have been, which have been good. But not everything's been implemented. For instance, if we had implemented a reconstruction and development program conceived in 1994 with vigor and sincerity and commitment, the equality would have been less. We'd have gone away, but they'd be reduced substantially. If we'd done certain things, even in business, our economy would have been bigger. We'd have grown much, much more. If we'd used state-owned enterprises in a different way, we'd have produced more engineers, more technicians, more, more everything for a better society. So we haven't implemented everything, but there are many other things that we have. Thank you very much. Are there, yes, in the back, please. Thank you very much for what we could have shared with you. It is wonderful to have this experience, somebody coming out at such a young age of Roman Island, being inspired by Madiba. And I really appreciate that. You have delivered also quite hot stuff with the four issues you have mentioned and the challenges for your society, for your most beautiful country. First, I want to ask you, did you share with Madiba after he had retired also the pain, what you have just explained, that the failure of inequalities, how this could have happened, what were the major seductions in the elite, in the leadership, that really made it not possible, that avoided the achievement. May I ask you, did Madiba also somehow feel betrayed by those who followed him? Also, that the beautiful constitution, you haven't been described, you have contributed, have be, has been betrayed. Tough questions, and you have had different stuff. I'm not going on with the hot stuff of land question because this is really hot stuff. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, tough questions. Any other tough questions? Laura. To get back to the youth and the role that the youth plays in claiming their right, where that's not to be discriminated against when it comes out, when it comes to dealing out candy or when it comes to access to education. Um, do you foresee a change in funding policy for higher education in the near future, and as vague as that time frame might be, um, which will make universities more accessible and more equally accessible for all South Africans, as the Fees Must Fall movement calls for? And do you think such a change would come, it would be initiated by the executive or might require a constitutional court ruling on the right to equality and the right to education. Thank you. <clears throat> um, sticking with the youth question, um, I recently spoke to a number of youths in South Africa that um, was uh, drawn into the gangsterism, and at the time, gangsterism, yeah, yeah. And at the time I was there talking to them, the big question um, um, in the news and the media was a, a, dis a decision to perhaps send in the military to deal with gangsterism. And in my view, that's obviously unconstitutional. And I was wondering if you were aware about, uh, of that debate and what your views on that would be. I started with the last, yes. <coughs> I'm sorry, but yeah. No, it's fine. Perhaps we, we round up. I don't see any other questions. Perhaps Imke, the last one, and then uh, we round up the discussion. And, uh, but we can afterwards still, uh, I hope that you're staying still a bit for a small reception that we have and be available for, for further questions. Please, Imke. 
Thank you. It's also a rather short question, I hope. I thought your comment on the world's freest press in South Africa was very interesting. Why do you think that is, and what could the rest of the world learn from South Africa in this respect? Quickly, can you got to, I'm going to say it clearer. Yeah. But it's slower, not clearer, slower. I'm sorry. Why, why yeah. Um, I thought your comment on the world's freest press was very interesting. What, why do you think that is, and what could the rest of the world learn from South Africa in this respect? Thank you. The world's free press. Free press. Free press, yeah. Sorry. All right, please. There are four very chunky questions, aren't they? Um, I was going to start with um, I don't know which one to start with. I normally go to the easy and leave the difficult last. I don't know how you write exams. I normally do the questions I know quickly and <clears throat> finish with the ones I struggle with. But um, let's start with the free press. I've, I think it's a very strong and entrenched value of our society. And people tried it even during apartheid. The media played quite a bold role then. But of course, there were casualties. Some got arrested, some got banned, some got killed, and so it was, it was more of a continuation. Um, South African press has always been quite left and considered itself progressive and consider itself to be enforcers of accountability. Needless to say, politicians don't like that, but, but they have been there. They've reported, by and large, without fear or favor, and there's no fear at home, frankly, because it's unheard of to arrest a journalist for what they report. It just doesn't happen. So that allowed, helped it to flourish. <clears throat> of course, there'll be other indirect censors and so on. Journalists, for instance, in state institutions, say SABC. There's some eras where there would have been a little concern. Electronic broadcasting. But that has been restored again. You know, there was a big revolt of journalists there, and, and, and I think that fear is gone. Radio, television, print media. Add social media to it, ooh, pandemonium. Just about everything gets said and written there, and there's a real new media. So South Africa is right up there, and that gives us a lot of hope. <clears throat> it means that conversations remain open and continuous. And, 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 and that's a form of social ventilation, which, which is good. Um, I thought I was going to talk about military intervention. Yes, to be unconstitutional. The Constitution pr provides a procedure for deploying the military. Now, it's for non-humanitarian interventions. Um, if you brought them in, to provide health care is quite different from law enforcement. And that procedure has to be followed and must be approved by parliament, by resolution of parliament, being reported to within, I think, 14 days of using the army. You have to report it, and parliament must express itself on that. So, yes, if it's used without more, that's what it would be. And I know every time Helen Ziller panics. She says, bring the army, bring the army. But uh, it's regulated in our, in our jurisdiction. The army was used during apartheid times to quell just about anything and everything. And soldiers were all over the show, and they shot many young people, many other people. So we regulate that in our constitution. You don't resort to military coercion, except in certain specified manners and after a procedure that's prescribed has been fulfilled. Um, fees must fall in equality. You'll know that <clears throat> the governing party has adopted a resolution to provide for free higher education for people below a certain earning threshold. 
and it's being rolled out this year. So it's full impact we are yet to see. So the problems are really administrative at this stage. But the principle that the state ought to pay for higher education is one that is quite consonant with the Constitution and it's consistent with, I have written a published article on that explaining how and why the demand is not one that is out of kilter with constitutional requirements. So, so it's a good call and the government has responded to it um, because the rioting continued and continued and continued and we're having elections next year. So it's not a wise thing to, to have rights all over the show at this stage. Let me get to the last question, which I hope is the last. I saw myself yawning. I've been flying for 18 hours <laughs> up to still this morning. Um, betrayal. You talk like a revolutionary, don't you? <laughs> There's a little story of the animal farm written by one George Orwell. And your head and mine should suggest that we have probably read that book. <laughs> um, let me talk about myself for starters. I was born and I grew up in the revolution. And my focus was very undivided was to destroy and terminate an evil system and replace it with a just system. And that's a normal idealism of any revolution. And as you know, a lot has been written about compromisation of revolutionary transitions, where the ruling elite departs from its original mandate. We saw a lot of that in Latin America. We saw a lot of that in parts of Southeast Asia. Indeed, we saw a lot of that in Eastern Europe and other parts of the world. I'm, I'm quoting more recent history, that's all. The French Revolution. So the the original mission, if we are to be a bit philosophical and revolutionary about this, the original mission quite often gets betrayed after transition. It's a mar marvelous film I saw. On the Indian transition called Children of the Midnight, which shows as the British aristocracy was making its way out and the people rushing into the white houses of the former British masters. And much of the persistent poverty in India was not unrelated to the method of transition. So yes, I mean, talking from an idealistic revolutionary position, I won't speak for Mr. Mandela, I was, I was disappointed. I wanted the system to be sweated more. I wanted more out of the system. Because that's what it was about. And even as a judge, I, I, I often went hot under the collar when Things did not happen that were due to citizens uh, because we had a, a chance to start afresh. Our afresh was always had baggage on it because inequality was there even with the transition. Both race and class inequality. But we could have done better. We could have, we, could have, we could have done much, much better. 
Before Mr. Mandela passed on, a few young people tried to suggest that he had sold out. I think you insinuate, you suggest that also, you imply that. Um, and he had an answer to this, which I thought was, because I saw him quite often before he passed on. As you know, I ended up being one of the executors of his estate, which I still am, with Mr. George Bezos. He said, De Khan, I've given you guys the keys to political power. And your duty was to use that in order to ensure that we achieve a more just society. So he had done a lot historically, he had played these cards well historically to create a democracy with an outright majority rule by predominantly African people. That he delivered on. And the next phase, inevitably, was one in which we had to entrench and deepen social transition. And so his answer was quite accurate on that one. Um, and as you had me, I think we have to go back and go and roll up our sleeves and work even harder. Some of us tried very hard. And to the point of my retirement, I thought it was very always clear in my own head that we should create the just society that we fought for, that we always understood we're entitled to. We've created a lot of it, but we've failed to create the other part that we need to do. So the state is not falling apart and all over the state. We just have to work harder and make sure that we grow the economy, we create spaces which are appropriate, we train more young people. Um, so betrayal is a strong word. But are there failures? Yes, there are failures. I've talked about them. And, and I think we have to, and I think many South Africans now are, are more candid about it. And the president is the first to talk about it, as, I, as you've heard me say. And I think um, he has a chance to make a difference. And we'll have to wait and see. Thank you very much. I have my own, yes, uh, for also this concluding very, very thoughtful statement. Um, yeah, thanks so much for coming to us, sharing your experiences with us, um, I think Justice Musinecke deserves a big applause. <laughs>